Tonight we'll be in the second chapter of Ephesians. This will be our 27th lesson. We're going to be in verses 17 and 18. I want to continue to call your attention to the magnitude of the salvation of the Gentiles. That's, that's that he's continuing to speak about this, write about this. This, uh, I don't believe there's very many people who have even entertained this thought, the salvation of the Gentiles. Not to mention how, what a marvelous thing it is, and in it, God demonstrated he, he can save when there's no possibility, from a human point of view, there's no possibility of salvation at all. The Jews did have some promises and so forth, but when it comes to the Gentiles, they had nothing. And so this magnifies God, see, that he has saved the people that were not a people. The Gentiles had nothing to do with this work. All they had to do, they were on the receiving end. That was it. Didn't have anything at all to do with the initiation of it. Nothing at all. They didn't seek God and they found him anyway. Yeah. According to the word of the prophet. Their condition was such it forbade any divine involvement. They were dead in trespasses and sins. They were living according to the course of the world. They were dominated by the wicked one. All right, that pretty well excludes you from, <laughs> from any kind of involvement with God, Just looking at it from this side of the coin. They'd not been given a law. They'd not been given a promise. They'd not been given a way to serve God, a service of God. They were truly without God and without hope in the world. Amen. That's why Paul's dwelling on this, because that can escape, you see. Once a person's in Christ, there's a kind of a uh, slumber that can settle over the soul, and you forget what was involved in saving you. And as soon as you do that, you get sloppy in your living and negligent. As soon as that happens, you'll not be able to live for God in this unless you're in a continual remembrance of what it took to save you. Amen. And as soon as you get used to it, it starts to dim. That's the way it is. Now, the explanation for the participation of the Gentiles is found in his mercy, kindness, and love. Now, neither of those are considered a powerful or influential forces in the world. Kindness, mercy, love. Nobody that I know of in the world thinks that this changes people. This is just something you pour out and most of the time it's wasted. That's how the world views it. Because they don't view kindness, mercy, and love as having power and working something and, and accomplishing something. See, it's just something you pour out. That's how the world view it. It's just something you pour out, but very little comes back. That's just, that's just how the world views these virtues. They view forceful things more that uh, dominate, dominating and this sort of thing. That's just a value to them. But of these three traits, God's uh, kindness, mercy, and love are among the greater attributes of God. They're among the most powerful. They have accomplished more than law accomplished. And law is righteous. The law was good and holy and spiritual, but it didn't didn't it didn't do anything beneficial. 
You might say, well, it was a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. Well, that is that is true, but it did it by con condemning us. <laughs> Says that we needed needed Christ. So some might have some might object, saying, well, God told through the prophets, He said that the Gentiles would would be in quest of learning of God. What about that? And this is true. Through Isaiah, God said, the Gentiles shall come to thy light. That's Isaiah 60, verse 3. Sixth verse says, and the forces of the Gentiles shall come unto thee. Jeremiah said, the Gentiles shall come unto thee from the ends of the earth. <laughs> so those texts are in there. But the coming he's drawing of, that he's speaking of, the impetus to it is divine drawing. See, you can come to God two ways. You can try and stumble in on your own. It won't be successful. You can be drawn in. Either way, you're coming. Jesus said that no man can come unto me except the Father sent me. Draw him. Amen. And the Lord Jesus gave some clue as to how this works. It focuses around the death of Christ. The drawing point is the death of Christ. I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. That doesn't mean when you preach Christ, he'll draw. That that, that may have a, That's not what he said. Next verse tells you, it says, This spake he of the manner of death, which he would die. So he was speaking, if I, if I die, if I'm lifted up from the earth and I die, using that, that event, I'll draw all men to me. Yeah. Amen. See, this is why when not much is made of the cross of Christ, you are in a fictitious religious environment. Amen. It's not real. God's not in it. Spirit's not in it. God's not in it. The thing that starts this whole thing rolling is the death of Christ. That's the point where all the foundations were firmly fixed. Then the, the work proceeded on the basis of that uh, that death. So Paul is uh, he's expounding the drawing part now. Tells what is involved in it. The richness of God's mercy. And the marvelous effects of his kindness. <laughs> when, when, our, when the condition of the Gentiles didn't summon kindness. Not from God's viewpoint. God didn't have mercy on the Gentiles because he felt sorry for them. Now you want to get this firmly in your mind. This is not why God saves people because he pities them. That's not why. It's because he purposed to do it. Amen. 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 Right. Salvation is not based on some kind of a whimsical love and pity and this sort of thing. It's based on his purpose. He determined to do this. That's what motivated him. Not the condition of the people. Because all the people, this should be very simple to reason out. Because if it was the condition of the people, he'd have saved them all. Now, who can't see that? Why would that be difficult to see? That if your condition is what awakened a pity and a desire for God to save you, then why is it that he didn't save everybody? Because that's not what moved him. It's his purpose that moved him. For a person not to know the purpose of God, you might like become a spiritual midget. You may have some life, but you can't you can't get anything on the top shelf, so to speak. <laughs> now our text says it starts out with and. Sixteenth verse tells about this death part. He reconciled both Jew and Gentile and God in one body by the cross, by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby, and uh -huh, we're going to learn something here about when God does something, he doesn't just like sit down. Jesus sat down, but he sat down to reign. When Jesus said it's finished, he didn't go like this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
So I have slain the enmity. He go, now, now he goes to work. And came and preached peace to you. See, that's, that's having slain the enmity. He, see, it didn't happen automatic. He came and preached peace. The enmity was between the Jews and the Gentiles. It was formalized by the handwriting of ordinances. That was a wall between them. God told them what to do. God didn't tell the Gentiles what to do. That was a wall between them. If a Gentile wanted to know anything about God, he had to go to a Jew. He could not get it from anybody else. He had to go to a Jew. He had to. He had to go to a synagogue or some, and that's where he went. The, Gentile, the temple had a court of the Gentiles, a place where they could go inquire. And every place Paul preached, remember in synagogues, there were Gentiles there. So if they wanted to know about Christ, they had. They couldn't say, could I have a copy of the Bible? And I'll read it and I'll figure it out. In Jesus' day, they had Bibles, Septuagint version, they had all the Moses and the prophets. Is that what a Gentile would do if he wanted to find God? Go down to the local market and see if he could pick up a copy of the Septuagint Bible? Well, people say, think you find God that way today, don't they? They say, we, everybody in the, on our country, they need a Bible. Well, they got a Bible. Where are they going to start? Leviticus? Maybe they read Ecclesiastes and say, just it's the same conclusion I came to. Everything's vanity. This is insanity. People can't find God by reading the Bible. God gives ministers who tell them what the Bible means. There's nothing wrong with reading the Bible, understand. But you could read the Bible for 80 years. And until somebody who knew Christ and was sent by God talked to you, that's all you would have done is read the Bible. Yeah. Yeah. I've thought, how in the world, if I did, how would you figure out, like, what's for today and what's for yesterday? How would you figure it out? What is there in the Bible that tells you that revelation isn't going on right now? Or that Exodus and the promises and Exodus before you know. How would you distinguish? How would you know who the Messiah was? How would you know what difference the Christ made? When they mentioned Christ, how would you know who they were talking about? That's why Paul, he's raised up. God knows this is the way it is. This is how God's kingdom works. How shall they believe on him whom they not, not read, heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? So this, that's what Paul's doing here. He's opening this up to them. There's a wall between people, and this is how God's kingdom can't have some people that know and some people that don't know. Some people that have access, some people that don't have access. See, this is not how kingdom, the God's kingdom works. Some people taught by God and some people not taught by God. This isn't how it works. Some people having access to God, some people not having access to God. See, the church world's got used to this kind of division in the church. See, so every church, no matter how big, no matter how little, they got some people that know and some that don't know. Some that are taught, some that aren't taught, some have access, some don't have access, some are living for God, some aren't living for God. And this is not what Jesus died for at all. Amen. Amen. See, well, what about growth? Well, the growth happens, but it does happen. If, uh, if your child took 50 years to become a teenager, you'd be going down to the doctor saying something, something's wrong here. Uh -huh. right. Something's definitely wrong here. I'm showing you why he had to make two into one. Because as long as that wall existed and there were two different, you'd have two different standards. Uh -huh. This is why there's so many divisions in the 
church. They haven't seen this one body. They haven't seen this. He had made both one. They haven't seen this. There's no separation at the national level, neither Jew nor Greek. There's no separation at the gender level, neither male nor female. There's no separation at the social level, neither bond nor free. So Jesus destroyed the enmity that makes for these different uh, divisions, and, and he came. This is after he died. This is after he rose from the dead. This is after he went to heaven, and after he was exalted in the seat of the right hand of God, he came. That's what, he, that's what he's talking about. Yeah. This is not his second coming, when he will come in all his glory. This is not when he came in the likeness of sinful flesh. This is not that coming. This is a different coming. Jesus referred to this coming that he's talking about here. It is true, he said to his disciples, if I go, I will come again and, and take you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. That's not what he's talking about here. He told him that night. Yes, go ahead. Before you get too far off of that, I was thinking on this making of both one and, and the wisdom that's demonstrated in that. Uh, and in making it, they both needed one another in order for this picture of salvation to to be complete. You can't have a separation from what God had done preparatory to the coming of Christ, which was all done in the Jewish nation. So you don't have a you don't have a cutting off of the continuing work of God by the the joining of the Jews to the Gentiles, mm -hmm. and yet. You, you have a, a full demonstration that it's not by works, by the entering Amen. in of the Gentiles Amen. to the Jews. So you have both sides of that. Amen. The, it, you, you can't have a division because salvation began before the world was yeah. created. And to see the continuity of it and the glory of it, you have both groups of people joined into one. Amen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're right that the at the ultimate demonstration of not of works is the acceptance of the Gentiles. Amen. That's the ultimate demonstration of it. Now Jesus told his disciples on the night of his betrayal that he, about this coming to read about, and he came. This coming. He said in John 14, 18, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. Now he's going to come in. The, he came in the Holy Spirit. He said, I, I, will pray, I will pray the Father. The Father will send you the comfort of the Spirit. And then he says, I will come to you. So he comes. In, so this is the coming that our text is talking about. He would not come to them in the flesh, but in the Spirit. And it would be so real that he would say, Lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the world. See, so <laughs> It's it's a re, it's a real coming. It's a different kind of coming. It's a very real coming. Now Paul mentioned this uh, this coming. Later, Paul will tell the Ephesians that they were among those who had been taught by Jesus. Ephesians four twenty. Ye have not so learned Christ, if so be that ye have heard him. And but taught by him as the truth is in Jesus. Well, they weren't in Jerusalem or in Canaan. They didn't hear that Jesus. They heard the speaking of this Jesus who came that we're reading about now. Peter, he, he spoke of this. Jesus coming after he went back to heaven. He, and before his second coming, he came. See, Peter spoke of it. He said, Repent, this is Acts 3, 19 and 20. Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be, be, may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord and he shall send Jesus, which before was preached to you. Then the next verse says, Whom the heavens must receive until the time for the restitution of all things spoken by the mouth of the Holy Prophet since the world began. So that's the second coming. But in the meantime, he'll send Jesus 
to the person whose sins are forgiven to dwell with him. This, uh, this is not referring to Acts 3, and he shall send Jesus. It's not referring to the second coming of Christ. I'm going to tell you why. He said, repent and be converted and that your sins may be blotted out. And he, in times of refreshing, shall come up from the presence of the Lord, and he shall send Jesus. All right, now here's the... Here, there, this sending had conditions. Hmm? Yeah. Repent. Yeah. Sins blotted out. In times of refreshing. Mm -hmm. Well, a second coming of Christ doesn't have any conditions. Yeah. Yeah. He's coming. Yes. It's not if. Mm -hmm. There's no if attached to Christ's coming. Mm -hmm. This coming, there's an if. You can see that. I don't know if you can see it, but it would throw my, throw my heart. John, he wrote, he wrote about this coming. He came. Our text says he came. John wrote about this coming. He taught that Jesus is come. That's after he went to heaven. He is come. This is 1 John 5, 20. We know the Son of God is come and has given us an understanding that we may know him that is true. So there's, there's this coming. It parallels the Ephesian text that he was taught. Jesus comes, he teaches. So there's a very real sense in which Christ does dwell in your heart by faith. Amen. He has come. <laughs> and he's in you, Christ in you, the hope of glory. See, he's, Christ came. He does it through the Spirit, but this doesn't negate the reality of his indwelling. In fact, Jesus said that if a person loved his word and kept it, that his father and him would take up their abode. So how's that? Now, a carnal person can't understand this. There's no need to try and explain it to them. They'll not be able to say, yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, but. What did Jesus do when he came? He came. <laughs> Well, he came preaching the first time. He come preaching this time, too. Yeah. He came and he preached peace. That's what he did. To both Gentiles, which were far off, and Jews, which were nigh. Well, the version say he proclaimed peace or announced peace or brought good news of peace. Now, technically, the Jews heard about it first on the day of Pentecost and following. But here the order is reversed. Ha, <laughs> that interesting. He came and preached peace to the ones afar off. He mentions them first, the Jews second. Now it's true, they had, the Jews heard it first, but the exposition of the peace was given to the Gentiles by Paul. Hmm? If you want to know what that peace involves, you got to read Paul. Mm -hmm. yeah. You're not going to pick it up anywhere else. Yeah. Marvelous. Which doesn't make sense. All the culture had been done with the Jews. Mm -hmm. All the preparatory work had been done with the Jews. But when it came to opening this thing up, he did it to the Gentiles. <laughs> Thank you, Lord, for saving us Gentiles. The gospel is called the gospel of peace. Two different places. Romans 10, 15, 6, 15. The gospel of peace. The good news of peace. That peace is peace with God. Mm -hmm. But who's ever at peace with God is at peace with his sons. Yeah, Isaiah said that they, was, they were going to publish peace <laughs> and bring good tidings of peace. Colossians 1 20 says Jesus made peace now he comes and he preaches peace it has to do in our text it has to do with Jew and Gentile but there's peace between them because there's peace between God and them you cannot be at peace with God this is impossible now this is impossible 
You cannot be at peace with God and hostile toward his people. This is not possible. You say, well, I know a lot of Christians that are hostile. They don't have this. If they say they do, they lied. Well, they're deceived. You cannot be at peace with God and hostile toward his sons and daughters, whoever they are. The idea is that those who are themselves at peace with God can no longer be hostile. Why? Because the middle wall of partition. And you can't come to God and keep that middle wall of partition. He destroyed it. We set our mind on things above. We rise up above. That's right. Everybody who believes. Yeah. That's right. Well, you've noticed this. You, I can. I've heard many of your testimonies about meeting people that you never met before, or talking to someone you've known which you didn't realize how they're closest to God, and how your heart leaped. <laughs> When this happened, what was that? That was the peace. Yeah, that's right. There was peace, right? Instant peace because you sensed this vertical peace, so there was a peace horizontal. Yes? Brother Ricky and I experienced this down in Florida where um, the Lord had sent us a couple, and the husband of this couple was a Jew. And we had sweet fellowship with them. Yeah. And it was an evident token to us that that wall had been taken away. Yeah. If that wall had still been there, we wouldn't have been able to have the fellowship and encouragement that we did. At That's the time. right. Amen. You can see what Paul is doing here in establishing these, uh, these Ephesians. Of course, in that day, there were Jews that were Christian Jews, if I might use that kind of phrase that were zealous for teaching circumcision and things like this and putting pressure on Gentiles. So this is a piece of good news now when he gave this to him. But now, <clears throat> you got to do something with peace. See, there in the kingdom of God, if you have a benefit, you have to do something with it. You don't just like put it in your pocket. It's not like that. I think sometimes people treat the life in Christ like that. They learn the truth, they stick it in their pocket. But you have to do something with it. Now here's what this peace works. You see, what God does has effects. For through him we both have access. Access? Yeah, that's, not, that's different than peace. <laughs> I could, I could be at peace with the President of the United States and not have access to him at all. For through him, we both have, those you in general, have access by one spirit to the Father. Now at this point, I want to take care to note how, how carefully and precisely Paul addresses the matter of having access to God. There is a lot of sloppy thinking and talking on this subject. Having access to God. Just going to God and so forth. Well, it's not quite that simple as I'm going to show you. The holiness of God and the nature and presence of the flesh does not allow for easy access to God. There's got to be some kind of buffer zone. There's got to be something to neutralize this. God has went on record, no one shall see my face and live. What do you think that means? That gets too bright, is that it? God's nature will not allow him to look at you eye to eye. Got to be something... Between, If he does, like with Moses, he reduces. He's just the hinder part. He's got to do it in, in, while Moses is bathed in glory. <laughs> and then that was just uh, the lesser glory. That was just the after, what we call like afterglow. Like a, you see a fireworks go up in the air when it comes on, there's a, there's a trail behind it. That's, that trail, that's what Moses saw. <laughs> he saw the, the, tail of the tail end of the thing. So it's not a, 
This is not a relationship with God like a child with the earthly father. I know there's people fond of talking about this, but they don't do the people of God a favor. You don't speak to God like your little child speaks to you. Those who advocate calling God daddy and sitting on his knee and this sort of thing are blissfully unaware of this circumstance. You can't get close to God in that way. I'm telling you, you can't. Not while you're in the body. So we have access through him. That's Christ. The him is Christ. Through him. Some versions say by him. Another improper reading it says of because of what Christ has done for us and because of Christ. All of the versions read through him. <laughs> the meaning is not that you have access to God because of what Christ did. This is not what this text is saying. Although the foundation for the privilege is what Christ did. But this we know. The death of Christ on the cross is not like a key that unlocked heaven's door or a ticket that gives you a right to come in before God. When we come to God, Christ brings us to God. Got to see this now. He doesn't authorize us to come to God. He brings us to God. Because he has put to death but quickened in the spirit that he might bring us to God. Not initially. Because you can't go to God and just like stay with God. You have to complete, complete your life here. The next time you go to God, you've got to be brought to God through him. When we come to the Father, well, Jesus said, no man comes to the Father but by, by, not through, by. Me, like, you take, you take someone's hand and take them in. Even after we're glorified, Jesus has got to stand with us when we stand before God. That's even after we're glorified. Huh? After we've been divested of the flesh, and there's nothing where, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, even in that state... Jesus was the one who will say, Behold, I and the children. Yeah. We won't say, Behold, we're here with Jesus. He's going to say, They're here with me. Amen. That's how sensitive a thing coming to God is. Because yeah. something to ponder in it. Yeah. Yeah. If that's the case when we're glorified, how much more the case now? Yeah. Coming before God. Jesus is the one that brings us, and he never brings anyone unless they're ready. That's right. He's, he's in the process of making them ready, but you just don't go there just to stand there. And, you know, there's a reason. You're, <laughs> if you're not ready, the presence of God will consume you. Because the glory of God is not discriminating. A fire goes out before him. Anything that's unlike him is destroyed. That's the way it is. And the only way you're not is because of who you're with yes. or who you come through Amen. or by whom you come. Whenever we're presented to the Father, Jesus is presenting his work to the That's Father. That's right. Amen. Yeah. So uh, just like you made the point that, that salvation is driven by the purpose of God, mm -hmm. well, our presentation to the Father is... It's the completion of Christ's work mm -hmm. so far as getting uh, getting God's people from earth to heaven. Just like on the cross when he said it is finished, it's like that, com that completed that portion of what had to be done as part of salvation. Amen. Now, okay, now mm -hmm. this, is, this is like another completion to that. As we're presented to the Father faultless, what we're seeing, not so much that 
from our perspective, like when we're ready, yeah. but when Christ has made us mm -hmm. presentable. Amen. In the full sense of the word, the only man God recognizes without any qualifications or reservations is Christ. Amen. Get right, right down to the bottom line. There's qualifiers to any other any other person. So I'm glad it's through Christ. <laughs> I'm glad we don't come to God through, say, Moses. He could just bring us so far. But God accepts Christ without any qualifications. It's Jesus hasn't got to present to God anything more than he is right now. Amen. You do. And when he says we both, we both, the same requirements apply to Jew as Greek, even though their preparations were different. The presentation and the peace is the same for both. We both have access to God. There's only one gospel. There's not a gospel for the Jew and a gospel for the Gentile. There's a denomination, Grace Bible Church is the name of it. There's not many around here. There were in Indiana. I dealt with some of these people. The Grace Bible Church teaches that there was one gospel Peter preached and another gospel Paul preached, and some Baptists teach this too. I'm not ashamed to say this because those that teach this are wrong. I do not respect them. I do not respect somebody that preaches that kind of stuff. Peter did not preach one gospel for the Jews. They say this so they can wiggle all their stuff out of baptism. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, if it sounds foolish to you, there's people who do this. And another by Paul. No, this, we both have access through him. Amen. One way. The, the death, the atoning death, and his triumphant resurrection, his glorious exaltation, were not for certain people. They are for all people that are coming to God Amen. through him. Now, if, if what, God, what Jesus did, foundational things he did, was for all people, then the effects, the effects of those things cannot be only to certain people. That's the reasoning. We both. All people. Further, the word both applies to the status of the people before they were in Christ. That's right. It's not both in Christ. That's right. See, because they're one body. They're not, they're not both anymore. Yeah. When you're in Christ, there's no such thing as both. Yeah. <laughs> That's out of Christ. Yeah. Now we're one body. Yeah. One body in Christ. We both have access to him. Other versions have access, they able to come near or have an entrance or have free access or can come to or have an open way or may come to or have an introduction to, have the right to come. Well, what does it mean to have access? Under the Father, we're talking about under the Father. Both of them have access through him, Christ, unto the Father. This is not an outer court experience. The Jews, remember said of the Jews, they were near. They were nigh. Remember said, Gentiles far off, Jews nigh. But they were outer court nigh. That's, right. <laughs> That's not in the presence. This is not talking about an outer court experience at all. It's not even talking about the holy place where you did the service. Uh -huh, yeah. And the candle was, the table of showbread, and you did all the work. It's not talking about that. No. That's access to the Father. It's not talking about holy place activity. It's talking about most holy place activity. Amen. That's where you're coming. We know this categorically taught. All right, here it is in Hebrews 10, 19, and 20. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest, mm -hmm. 
There it is. By the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way. So it's the holiest. This is the real presence of God, like the parallels the mercy seat. Parallels that. We both can come into the presence of God through by through Jesus and by the Spirit without being destroyed. There aren't any lest he die statements connected with this. See, when we draw near, we're drawn near to a throne, right? Yeah. Hebrews 4, 16. We come to the throne of grace, and the throne parallels the mercy seat it's where God is. Even that shadow was approached only one time a year. The Day of Atonement. That was a high day. One time a year, they approached what we would call a throne in Christ. But we have, we could come, let's see, it says boldly. That means confidently. We can confidently come into the presence of God. Well, see, it's one thing to say this. It's another thing to actually do this. When they, the Israel came into the presence of God's glory, they, 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 they didn't come confidently. <laughs> they, they were trembling and shaking, and even Moses said, I exceedingly fear and quake. Well, as soon as a little bit of glory showed, all confidence just drained away. It wasn't there anymore. Some man of God see an angel, oh, he'd fall down. Daniel became sick. John just fainted dead away. On the Isle of Patmos, when he confronted the glory of an angel. But you're coming into the presence of God through Christ confidently. Access with confidence. Now, the person who's not in fellowship with Christ, they can't come to God. They're, they're restricted to the outer court. That's why it's so serious. See, it's so serious to become a backslider. Now you're going to have to have someone else who's going to help to have to help you here. Ultimately, it will be the Spirit. I understand that, but God just won't receive someone that's not fellowshipping with His Son. This just won't happen. He cannot approach unto God in the sense of our text. Both have access to God. Now, notice how again, how particularly was through him. Then he had, there's another qualifier on top of that. And by the Spirit, by one Spirit. So there you have the entire Godhead. You approach, you have access to the Father through the Son, by the Holy Spirit. That's how difficult it is to get through to God, brethren. Now, it's not a difficulty that should make you weep because it's all been made possible through Christ Jesus. But if you take Jesus out of the scenario and the Holy Spirit out of the scenario, nobody can come to God. Amen. Amen. Quite effective. Now, no, not, there wasn't one high priest that ever entered into that holy place casually. It, 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 that never happened. I mean, it was such a serious thing. And yet the, the picture that we have that we're coming confidently unto the throne of grace, you got to wonder how that would ever have resulted in a doctrine that just says you just come as, yeah. as you are. Yeah. You just come, walk right in. But, but it, it, obviously this parallel has not been understood. No, it that, that he's given a, He's given us a picture. I mean, you could have been born, let's say you were, were born from the right blood. You were from the tribe of Levi. That does no guarantee you were going to become the high priest. No. That they could only go in once a year, but maybe you never could go in your whole lifetime because you just weren't the high priest. Yeah, but here... Come from Aaron's lineage. That's right. Yeah. 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 Draw in there. Come in there. It's to the throne of grace that we come near, of course. By one spirit. <laughs> this includes the Holy Spirit making intercession for you. Romans 8, 26 and 27 says the Spirit makes intercession for you from within. In word groanings that can't be uttered. I mean, they can't come out of your mouth. 
It doesn't mean you speak in tongues. That's not what that means. It says they can't be uttered. Tongues can be uttered. Your person really doesn't have to have a degree to be able to figure that out. Spirit's intercession, it includes his leading, led with the Spirit. It includes this crying out, Abba, Father. Jesus sent the Spirit into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father, Galatians 4, 6. Now, all three members of the Godhead are characterized by life. Jesus said the Father has life in himself, John 5, 26. Jesus said, I am the life. John 14, 6, and Romans 8, 2 refers to the spirit of life. You see, all three members of the God is associated with life. This means God cannot be accessed by a routine, see, or praying through, or fasting. It's, a, it's life, that is the point. Now, I want to say a word here particularly to the young, but if it applies to anybody else, just pick it up. Jesus taught us when we pray to enter our closet and shut the door. <clears throat> I've noticed throughout my lifetime, not just children, but people that prayed with their eyes open. And when I was a kid, of course, I'd sneak a look, and I always wondered about that. I'm going to tell you, children, because some of you I know have your eyes open when we pray, why you shouldn't do that. Because your eyes are like windows that let whatever you see in, and it interferes with the prayer. So you shut your eyes, you keep them shut, and that doesn't guarantee the prayer is going to be effective, you understand? But this cuts down on the distraction. That's the, that's the reason for doing something like that. I wish someone had said that to some of the kids I went to church with, but they didn't. So you can see it's, it's life. We come through him, living, by the Spirit, living, to God, who is living. So it has, your prayer or access to God is a response. See, some Christians are like paralyzed people. They breathe and all that, but they are paralyzed, <laughs> quadriplegic. I don't know if Christ really has any people like this, but that is the way it looks. Bunch of invalids. But see, this having access to God, this is not invalid activity. This is not quadriplegic activity, not coming into the presence of God. Moses had to climb up on top of a mountain to do it, and Elijah did too. Both have access to God by through him, Christ, by one spirit. Now he's going to reason on this. Now, therefore, see, it's what you do with the truth that tells the story. What do you conclude from this? We both have access to the Father through Christ, by one spirit. What do we conclude? Well, now, therefore, we're no more strangers. Now, therefore. He is holy reasoning. Mm -hmm. He's knowing what to do with the truth. When you learn the truth, you got you got to do something with it. You got to reach some kind of conclusion. A lot of people tend to deal with the things of God theoretically and philosophically. They never really come up with any really sound conclusions or positive thought that makes them move or constrains them to do something. They just, they kind of beat around the bush and theorize and all this sort of thing. Not Paul. He does something with this truth that he's saying. There are certain things that had to be, that had to happen before you could have access Sin had to be taken away. The devil had to be destroyed. Principalities and powers had to be spoiled. The way to God opened. See, all that had to be done before you could even come to him through Christ by the Holy Spirit.
And once Jesus was exalted, he had to do something with his position, and he does. He's bringing many sons to glory. Now my question is, what are you doing with your position? I mean, you got to answer it. I, I'm not uh, going to try to answer it. I got my work cut out with myself. But with myself, what are you? What are you doing with the call that God's issued? With this access to God. What do you? What do you do with this access? Huh? Do you, do you ask for a, two hot dogs instead of one? I mean, what do you do with this access <laughs> that you have to God? What, what are you going to take? What are you going to bring up to God when you have access to him, huh? Jesus said to Bartimaeus, uh, what would you like me to do for you? Amen. Well, what if Bartimaeus said, look, Jesus, could you talk to the people that you throw a little more money in the in my bucket here when they come by. I'm not getting very much. Listen, there's some people that do stuff like this. Uh -huh. They might say, I've had this garment for quite a while. Could you miraculously give me a, like another garment that maybe would last for a longer time? What do you do with your access? Amen. Lord, that I might receive my sight. He knew what to ask. He knew what to ask for. If you're going to ask God for something, you ask him for something nobody else can do. Amen. If you say, Lord, I'd like to have a million dollars. All right, there's a bunch of people in the world that if they were so moved could give you a million dollars without having any problem at all with it. Yeah. That may sound big to you, but this is nothing compared to yeah. the Trumps and Gates and people like this. When you come to God, you ask for something only God can do. You're going to pray for the sick? The scripture says pray for the sick. Yeah. Uh -huh. Then pray something that only God can do. You have access. Now, as I've mentioned, all of this is easy to talk about, but the impact of it is something else. Now, therefore, we're no more strangers than foreigners. To each other. Remember he said we're you're strangers and foreigners that's come as compared to the Jews. Strangers and aliens. We don't fit in. We don't, we're not from the same country. We don't, we don't speak the same language. We don't have a privileged status. That's how we were. We didn't have a privileged status. Cornelius prayed but God had to say, send the message down to Cornelius before anything measurable happened. This involves, also today, we, there are people who are called Christians who are strangers and foreigners to the things of God. <laughs> they don't understand the things of God. They can't figure them out. They're strange to them. I understand that everyone starts at that point, but these people aren't interested in getting beyond that point. 15, 20, 30, 40, 50 years, they still don't know. They're strangers and foreigners. See, we doubt salvation dissolves this strangership and, and foreigner, being a foreigner, it dissolves that. Amen. So not strangers and foreigners, not misfits anymore. Now, if you're really a zealous for the Lord, now you become a misfit in the, in the average church. You're a misfit. Yeah. Oh, you are. Right. Ever, everyone as honest knows this is the case, and I don't know of any place that this isn't the case uh, it's on a large scale. Mm -hmm. In some sense, everybody is a stranger and a foreigner in some sense. You're either a stranger and a foreigner in the world, or you're a stranger and a foreigner before God and his people. Uh, yeah. one, one or the other. If you're in Christ, you're not stranger and foreigner to any of God's people or to God himself. Amen. Instead, as the text says, you're fellow citizens. Mm -hmm. Not the only citizens. Mm -hmm. Fellow citizens. I love that. There's a fellowship with all saints that includes like an understanding and communion. Mm -hmm. It's a fellowship, communion. 
that doesn't exist anywhere else. We're fellow citizens with us saints. How many saints? All the saints. Saints are holy ones, all the holy ones. I'm not interested in any church member that is not holy. I will just refer to them as Gentiles in the flesh, which know not God. Anybody that's not holy, they're out. Fellow say, well, the saints, that's what saints are. And of the household of God. Now, in household, there's at least three things that are emphasized in household. Provision, care, and employment. Household. That's how a household worked. Everybody in the household is cared for. And uh, everybody in the household was fed. And everyone in the household had something to do. That's the way it was. We're the house of God. Household of God. First Timothy 3.15 refers to the house of God. And Hebrews 10.21 says Jesus is a high priest over the house of God. And Peter said Joseph begins at the house of God. God has a, he has a household. And in this household, he provides for his people. <laughs> it's like Solomon. Uh, he, I want to read these two texts because they're so impressive. Solomon, he fed his, his household. Very sumptuous. We'll give you a little sample of what the menu was each day. See if you'd like to duplicate this. Now, this is a picture of Christ. This is 1 Kings 4, 22 and 23. Give me a second here. And Solomon's provision for one day, one day, was 30 measures of fine flour, three score measures of meal, 10 fat oxen, 20 oxen out of the pastures, 100 sheep, besides hearts, roebucks, and the low deer and the fatted fowl. It's a menu for the day. Now, when Isaiah said he's going to prepare a feast of fat things, yeah. you, you, <laughs> you think of that. Uh -huh. See? Then there's a Nehemiah. He's, he set a pretty good table himself. He invited uh, some workers in. Nehemiah 5, 17 and 18. Moreover, there were at my table 150 of the Jews and rulers beside those that came unto us from among the heathen that are about us. Now that which was prepared for me daily was one ox, six choice sheep, also fowls were prepared for me, and once in ten days, store of all sorts of wine. Well, I can tell you that God outdoes Solomon and Nehemiah. Amen. He's prepared a feast of fat things indeed. Nehemiah had uh, all kind of people there. He even had people come into town from elsewhere that mm -hmm. sat at his table. Well, that's like God. He's had all, all, all of the people from the cultured race that are in Christ. They sit at his table. He brought in the strangers from the outside, sets them down at his table, and he gives them an abundance and gives them access to him like Nehemiah had to Ahasuerus. He had access to the, mm -hmm. to the king like Esther had to, yeah. to her husband. 
So you have access to God through Christ mm -hmm. by the Spirit. Yes, amen. <laughs> amen. All right, any of you have any comments? Yeah, we, uh, I, I know in myself that um, you won't come very often and stay very long if you don't know that if you don't know that you're accepted. That's right. You just won't do it. And but if you can see that Christ's sacrifice was accepted, and that if and, and that you're in Him, and that you can come confidently because you're not coming based yeah. on what you've done, you're coming based on what He's done, and that makes all the difference in the world. Amen. Amen. Mr. Barb. I was thankful to see the shadows that the Lord gave, even under the old covenant, of making the two people into one and yeah. allowing for the proselytes yeah. to come and be a part of the Jewish Amen. nation, the two people becoming one. And it's like the Lord was giving indication that it's going to be larger than just the work that's begun here, that it's going to continue to flow together Amen. to grow larger. Amen. Yeah. Any others tonight? I was mindful yeah, of that. Remember that rich man that came to Jesus who was interested in eternal life? Yeah. And he was turned away when he said, if you want to be perfect, sell all you have. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Come and follow me. And then Jesus said that it is easier for a camel to go to the eye of the needle That's mm -hmm. right. than for a rich man to be saved. Yeah. You may recall the disciples, their response is that they were exceedingly amazed and said, mm -hmm. and who can, who then can be saved? That's right. right. Well, with men. Yeah. This is impossible. It is. It doesn't matter what aspect of salvation you're yeah. talking about. Yeah. Uh -huh. Putting sin away, and, the, and, the, and the, it is amazing how much is required That's right. just to come to God. That's right. But there's not a bit of it that a man could possibly accomplish. So that mm -hmm. makes us very thankful. We didn't get into this tonight, but once you come to God, John said, if we ask anything according to his will, we have the petitions guaranteed. Of course, that's a pretty big if. Amen. Yes, Sister Tasha. Yeah, you had said at one point that there, there's nothing attached to coming before the Lord lest ye die, that, that statement. Yeah. Um, and, and we see throughout Scripture the preparation that God was making in order that he would be able to have fellowship with his people that yeah. he made for himself. Mm -hmm. And so this is the access that we have is mm -hmm. with, with our Lord is that he's pleased with Christ, with the offering that Christ made, and so we can come through Christ by the Spirit and mm -hmm. commune with the Lord. Amen. And this, yeah. this was his desire from the beginning, is to have a people for himself that Amen. he would be able to commune with and to work with, and, and they serve him. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. Brother Gibbons? Yes. Uh, early on here, you talked about how that those who uh, come to God are at peace with one another also. And this is something that's it's hard to see in the world that we live in because of this. Yeah. But this is a work that the Lord is doing that uh, when Jesus, he picked a, a doctor, a lawyer, fisherman. These are the kind of men he put together. See, You can see how the Lord could take different people and bring them in, into one. Amen. And not have any differences of, of opinion. Amen. To strive together as one body, and it, it's very um, gratifying to be able to see that. To know, because again, the time that we live in, it's hard to find this. Yes. But to know that we're going to be with a number that cannot be numbered, that there's not going to be any differences. We're all going to be the same for eternity. Amen. Now, we, I, I experienced this in two different times. Near the Indiana church at 26 in Colfax. The auditorium was not as big, I don't believe, as this room. And one of our members he had a heart attack. Well, actually, before he was a member, his heart attack brought him to Christ. But his doctor was an eminent heart surgeon in Hamlin, Indiana, St. Mary's Hospital, which is a big hospital. He was a well-known heart surgeon. And he noted this Brother Harold's faith. <coughs> and that man brought his wife and two children and attended our fellowship until he went off to New Tribes Mission as a missionary. And we, we, were, we were in a 
the armpit of Gary, which is the murder capital of the world, Black Oak. Mm -hmm. This is like when you come out and your car is not gone, you give thanks. This this kind of neighborhood. And some of our people did come out and it was gone. But at any rate, Sterling Theobald is his name. And he wasn't ashamed at all. His clothes probably cost more than the rest of our clothes <laughs> put together. The second was at our men's fellowship, we come across a man who was a photographer, a newspaper photographer, rather well-known art that I can't recall his last name. But he attended one of our men's fellowships and he was the first one to have a, put in my mind the idea of photographing a men's fellowship. He took a picture of us and he was a, this is not the kind of gathering he normally would go to, but he was drawn. Those are two first-hand experiences that we've had where these are just common people sitting around. Neither one of these men were ashamed at all of being with us, and we certainly weren't ashamed of having them there. But if you, you'll live long enough, you'll experience something like this. Probably you have probably already. Someone that identified with the people of God who, if it wasn't for them being the people of God, that they, they never would have been identified with them. Just like that. Yes. Me and my mom, sister Nikki, were talking a little bit about this earlier today, about um, coming to God and how the idea today is how you can come as you are and all that. But if that were completely true, then there would be no need for Christ because it is because yeah. of Christ that we come to him. But not only that, but he doesn't just dress you up so that you appear all right before God, but he actually does change you to where you really are suitable to stand before God. Yeah. Amen. And we want to be clear that when, when we say that it, it's complicated, it isn't that that God like would destroy you if you didn't have this or that. God has made these provisions through him by the Spirit because he doesn't want to. Yeah, that's right. Because he doesn't want Amen. to destroy us. See? Uh -huh. <laughs> so that's how, that's how you view this. It's the provision of salvation and the provision of a means to approach him, mm -hmm. that confirms to you that God does want, that's right. as lowly as you may be, mm -hmm. God does want your fellowship. Amen. And you can see it. It's... He t gave he gave you Christ as by Christ. There were some things that needed to be done that you couldn't do. Yeah. He did them, and then he gives you the Spirit. There was some, you would not even have a desire, but he gives you the Spirit. Now you have this desire, this this, this, this a salvation that's accomplished, yeah. and a God that wants that draws yeah. you into His presence. It, we we can't can't help but win. It's you come right. into His presence, and what are you going to get? You're going to get a blessing. Amen. Yeah. Amen. And you know when you have these impulses to go to God always always drop everything and obey him Amen. do that because it, there sometimes we just I need to tell the Lord this or I need to tell the Lord that mm -hmm. follow through with that yeah. yeah. alright we'll have a word of prayer